Hey, just a really quick note to say thank you so much to all of our new subscribers. And if you haven't yet subscribed, why not? It means you're the first to know about brand new episodes of High Performance, and it also means we can attract incredible new guests to the show. So please hit subscribe right now. Enjoy the show. Harry, Roger, thank you so much for joining us for High Performance. Let's start with what you believe high performance to be from the things you've seen by studying mammals with the work that you've done. What would you go for? Well, animals at their best. I mean, survival of the fittest, you know, it sort of sums it up, doesn't it? It's, to survive in nature every day, you've got to be at your best. You know, you don't get a second chance. So that's high performance. You know, when you're seeing a cheetah and it's not fed for three or four days and it's got to make that kill today, otherwise it's going to starve it's got to be its best, you know, you're not going to get a gift wrapped delivery package of, you know, nicely fresh seasoned gazelle. You've got to hunt that down and get it. And to do that, you've got to be your best. So you've got to perform at a very high level. Yeah, totally. I think the stakes are always highest in nature. There's no second takes. Um, and, you know, animals are just beautifully adapted to their purpose. And each one of them is just designed to be at their high performance at all time. And then for us, I was going to say, in terms of filmmakers, we've got to then be at our best to capture that on film. We, we have to mirror the high performance we're observing. <laughs> yeah, totally. So what have you observed then that, that gives you the evidence or the reasoning for why mammals are the ones that have conquered the Earth? So mammals are a really unique group of animals in that they just have this amazing adaptability. Um, they're often very intelligent, you know, we're mammals undeniable that we've conquered the earth but also mammals have really conquered every habitat on earth with their adaptations with their unique characteristics some of them have developed superpowers supersonic hearing echolocation the ability to see in the dark to communicate underwater you know they've really pushed the boundaries of what of what's possible in nature yeah bats are a great example i think people mm. like to overlook bats in fact people get quite creeped out by bats but nearly a quarter of all mammals are bats. So there's like 1,500 different bat species. Mm. So there's 6,000 mammals on Earth. Sorry. It's the species of mammals. There's 1,500 of them bats. But those bats are so highly developed and so highly tuned for what they do. You know, they're operating in pitch, you know, in pitch black, pitch yeah. dark, and um, flying around, not bumping into things, and, you know, using this superpower, this echolocation to, to catch their prey. And that can be... We've got bats fishing in the series, yeah. which is extraordinary. And echolocation is extraordinary, but it doesn't penetrate through water. So it bounces off the water. Mm. So what they're waiting for is a fin of a fish to break the water. Mm. So when they're sending their signal, it will hit that fin and then they will... Yeah. Extraordinary, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, like, it's wow. kind of jaw-dropping, yeah. brilliant, high performance. Yeah, isn't but, it? Mental, but yeah. people don't think about bats, but they're extraordinary. Yeah, totally. And they're perfectly designed for what they do. Yeah. Give us another one, Harry. I mean, because this is fascinating. <laughs> we, like, this is what I love, though, because we are walking around on the earth surrounded by miracles, right? Yeah, we Left, are. right and centre. Yeah. But we're not taking our hands and our eyes off our phones or off our immediate family or off our immediate issues to no. actually realise the magic that's all around us. I mean, us. hyenas, Harry, you filmed hyenas. They're extraordinary, aren't they? Yeah, hyenas are amazing and they often get a really bad rep. You know, I, I grew up thinking of hyenas kind of like in The Lion King as these, like, cackling underlings of the bad guy. Um, but actually, they're incredibly intelligent, madly social. Their social bonds are really what make them super, super successful. And they're a female-led society, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> they, they're, when we went to film them, it was really incredible to see them at their best because, you know, they're pretty cool to watch in the day, but we really wanted to see them in, a, in their in their most extreme situation, which is at night. So we use specialist cameras, thermal cameras, to be able okay. to film them in the pitch black. Um, in this amazing location, the Ngongo Crater, which is in Tanzania, it's like a dormant caldera volcano. Huge, huge area, about twice the size of Bristol, about the same size as Birmingham, which is where I'm from. Enormous place. But um, yeah, we were looking for hyenas in there, and seeing what they were getting up to at night, hoping for something like a hunt, and just to see them kind of band together in the dark and really use their manpower, the sheer numbers to overwhelm something was like totally incredible and unbelievable and not really something that I expected to get, to be honest. But it's the strategy, isn't it? It's the strategy, they, yeah. They, they have a den where they all hang out in the day, all super chilled, looking after the pups and stuff. And then as night 
begins to creep in, they mm-hmm. will go out in different directions, individuals. So scouting. So then it's up to which scout will find what they're looking for. So a scout will maybe find a buffalo and think, oh, I'm going to have a sniff around that buffalo. But that hyena is never going to take that buffalo down on its own. Yeah. So what it does, it puts its head to the ground. It does this incredible call, like this whoop, like this, and it bounces off the ground. This is a theory, this is what it does. <laughs> whoop, so it's echoing like that. And that call can spread for three miles. So all those other hyenas that have gone out on that scouting mission... Can hear them, yeah. Okay, guys, and then they all start trucking towards the whoop, yeah, totally. you know? And they're all piling, and suddenly from one hyena, there's now 50 hyenas, all on the case now, bringing this buffalo down. It's extraordinary, the strategy, the sophistication. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's crazy. So, as two people that have studied mammals and the, and the, the species in general, yeah. what, what are the lessons that you think human mammals can learn from them? Well, I mean, watching mammals, the par- parenting is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, the parenting is extraordinary, and it's... It's interesting because it's probably also mammals' greatest weakness is that in order to develop young, which is quite well adapted and advanced in terms of animals, they, they, it requires a lot of parental care. So it's a lot of investment to raise a young mammal really relatively to other species. Um, and so the parenting, the level of parenting among mammals is extraordinary. Like the parental care that you see is next level. Like what sort of stuff? Like... You know, learning is really important in the mammalian world. Um, I filmed elephants learning roots to find food. um, And that's something that's really key to learn, like where you can find the best food, what you're doing, and where the best areas are to find seasonal food. And in this situation, it's really interesting because actually the elephants had learned that one of the best places to find food was in in people's gardens, in the town, right? (laughs) People have built a town on your doorstep. It's a great place to go and find a snack. Um, But in order to not be detected, because most people don't like elephants walking around their gardens, um, they had to sneak into the town at night. So then this mother elephant was teaching its family the best routes into the town, how to go in at night so you don't get detected, where to find the good food at different times of year. Um, And it was really incredible just to watch. And it was really a privilege to be able to experience that with them and see, like, you know, a, a mother elephant break up a really hard food for a baby elephant and watch them try. They're trying to whip this little branch around like the mum and copy them. It's really amazing to like see it in action. Um, watch them trying to learn how to use their trunk. It's extraordinary. Yeah, exactly. Like 12,000 muscles in a trunk yeah, or something so, ridiculous. Are they born able? Like, are they no, like, it's like, like flipping babies. around. They're born like, and they can't use their They're born their like babies, yeah. So yeah. most mammals are born able to stand, especially yeah. they if have they're prey species. They're gonna get. Course, yeah, they're yeah. going to get nailed. But other than that, there's a lot to learn. Um, and obviously, the more intelligent the animal, the more there is to learn. So, yeah, elephants are born unable to really use their trunk. It's a really highly specialised um, limb. And, and so it kind of, they flap it around like a little wet noodle. Like, <laughs> Hey, everyone. I just want to talk to you very briefly about what I believe to be a total revolution in sleep. And it's called Eight Sleep. It's a pod cover that goes on the mattress that's currently on your bed and it controls the temperature to suit you perfectly. And it all works from this app. Me and my wife, we like different temperatures. I actually like my side of the bed cooler. But the eight sleep isn't just about the temperature. It's your own personal sleep coach. So just look at the information that I wake up to. I get a sleep fitness score. I can find out more about the quality of my sleep, the kind of routine that I'm in. But it also gives me the different sleep stages as well. So I can find out how much REM sleep or deep sleep I'm getting. And then I can tailor things in my own life, like alcohol or coffee before bed or when I work out to try and improve my sleep. And we all know that sleep is the foundation of high performance. If we can improve our sleep, we can improve so much of our life. It's time to bring tech to the bedroom by going to eightsleep.com forward slash HPP, where you can get 200 pounds off your pod and free shipping. That's eightsleep.com forward slash HPP. This must be quite humbling, right? Because I think that One of the mistakes we make as humans is by thinking that we've got everything figured out and we Mm. are the super speed. And and in many ways, you can argue that because Mm. we are at the very top, right? Mm. But our babies are born pretty useless. Yeah. And I wonder whether if we had to evolve as they have out in the wilds, whether our babies would be born different now. Because you couldn't couldn't do that, could you, if you were the mum of a little monkey? You know, it wouldn't be possible for that monkey to be born and just for the first six months sit on the ground and do nothing. 
I think it's an interesting point. Human babies yeah. are pretty useless. I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying that. <laughs> we, all, we all were one once. So yeah, we're okay. exactly. But the whole kind of like floppy head thing and, you know, the, yeah. Yeah, just helpless yeah. little things. Really. They can't even crawl. They can't even babies. crawl. So as humans, if we were suddenly dumped in the wild without all the garb and stuff that we have in our lives today, we would not be very successful, I don't believe. No. Or we'd have to have a high degree of protection for our human babies that somehow allows us to raise them over here yeah. whilst we can go out and hunt to gather, I suppose. And but, I think yeah. this is what happened and why society but, and, and community is so important yeah. to yeah. humanity yeah. and is an important part of our evolution is that this idea that our young are so vulnerable that really they need round-the-clock care mm. and that has to be shared among people. Because sure. when, you, when you see primates, which is the closest relative to us. I mean, those mm. babies are hanging on, aren't they, to their mums. It's, they're, they're able to grip, basically. And yeah. that's what allows them, I think, to succeed and, and grow in the wild and yeah, grow up. Yeah. But there was another theme I wanted to explore with you around mums, mm. because having been around elite sport a long time, yeah. like lots of sports coaches use metaphors from your world. You know, at Saracens Rugby Club, they talk about the wolf pack. Mm. Okay. I've worked with some teams that admire the African hunting dogs because they've got yeah. the biggest kill ratio. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I'm interested in what what you've learned from your study of mammals that we can relate to working in teams or in groups more effectively. Well, again, if they don't get teamwork right, they're not going to survive. So it's, it's all about communication. I mean, again, those hyenas are a great example, in my opinion. Mm. Um, the way they understand each other's role. They have... Also, say within a wolf pack, you have clear leadership. There's an alpha male, yeah. and that guy is in charge, and everyone has to get into line, you know. And is it quite dictatorial? In some ways, it is. You don't you don't argue with that alpha unless you want to get some backlash. You're going to get it. Yeah. But again, it's a tough world out there. You know, it's not a game. So, you know, in terms of sport analogies, I suppose if you're going to succeed, you've got your captain on the pitch and the guys need to listen to him. And if they don't listen to him, he's probably going to give them a mouthful, you know? And maybe that clarity is what you need and that's what makes you successful. But yeah. in a world like that, like, how does an alpha become an alpha then? It's a very good question. Sometimes you can, you can see um, yeah. in cubs when they're born, say within um, a lion pride, there'd be one that's just a little bit bigger, he's got a little bit more attitude and, um, you know, he would have had the bloodline that's come down from the the pride male, if you like. So that pride male is in charge of the pride. So for whatever reason, he's just, he's a bit more spiky, he's a bit more authoritative, he's a bit more in charge and the other cubs are a bit more perhaps, you know, laid back and a bit more playful. Yeah, they can be. I mean, like hyena pups, for example, they start fighting for dominance within a few days of being born. So in the den, they're already really? fighting. When you see them, people think they're playing. They're not playing. It's serious. This is all about who's going to end up as the future queen of this group. And it's determined really, really early on for them. So ev every second counts really as soon as they're out. Yeah, I think that's what I mean. One will rise up and mm. you'll, you'll just see the dominance straight away. Yeah. And is there a difference between female and male-led um, cultures? Um, <laughs> that's that's a big question. Point, right? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, there is. There's obviously differences. Um, but a lot of them come down to the same thing, I suppose. It's all about who's the best individual for the job. Um, so in orca, intelligence is really key. And, and so I guess, like, it's a bit irrelevant. In the hyenas, they had to, the, it's actually the females that are bigger, they're physically bigger. Um, and they also developed a, a special organ called the pseudo penis that Gives them another edge. On Go on, the you, have to you can't. Oh, no, no, no. It's quite curious. Turn like that in this is the mammal's like, yeah. 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 yeah, it's one of the weirder mammalian facts. But they, female hyenas, have uh, an enlarged clitoris, and and it's it's just a symbol of dominance. And remarkable. they use it. They use it to signal dominance to each other and yeah. to socially interact. You know, it's a bit weird. Mm, but yeah, there's a lot of sniffing. There's a lot yeah, of Yeah, when two cocking. hyenas meet each yeah. other, they'll sniff each other's genitalia. That's how you say hi in hyena. Okay. And that will tell them a lot about that individual and their social standing. Yeah. Oh, wow. They get right down to it very quickly. There's no small talk. It's just... <laughs> I'm from Norfolk. It's very similar. <laughs> uh, this is... I think this is so interesting because... Again, coming back to this idea that we're all walking around kind of almost blind mm. to this stuff. Mm. Like you two, we'll talk about your reasons for wanting to do this in a moment. Mm. But you know, you have had such a privilege to be so close to 
these mammals that most people will never get that close to. And we'll talk about the advent of technology as well, because I think that's mm. fascinating that, mm. you know, our children can now see a closeness to the animal kingdom that just wasn't available to us, mm. you know, 30, mm. 40 years ago. Mm. I'd love to know what you've seen. Not only that it's just the thing that has blown you away where you've just gone, I can't believe what I've just witnessed here, mm. but also the thing that you've thought, why don't we live like that? This makes total <laughs> sense. Why are humans messing around with these old ideas? Why are we not learning this from the, from the mammalian world? I mean... Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I like... This is a bit weird, but I, I filmed chimpanzees building nests for the mammal series yeah. we made. Um, it opens a dark show. It's a beautiful little sequence. But um, in order to do that, in order to be where they were... So chimpanzees build a new nest every single night sleep in nests kind of like a bed like we do in the tree and they build a new one in a new place every single night so in order to be there when they build the nest we had to follow them all afternoon ready for when they built the nest and just by following the group you know you start kind of like getting into the swing of being a chimpanzee and um and it was kind of beautiful. They like have this amazing life where they like walk for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. Not so fun when you're carrying loads of equipment in the sweaty African sun. <laughs> um, but they do, and they're you know playing, and they like find a tree that's fruiting, and then they sit and they eat the fruit, and then they just carry on, and it's like all very like beautiful. It's way chill, but it's, also, it's, it's kind of back to basics as well, yeah, isn't it? Exactly. And I think they don't fuss and worry about a lot of the things that we worry about. Life's quite simple, but in yeah. a way they look kind of happier for it. Yep. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah. they know exactly what they need to do and what they're doing. You know, they're being led. The kids are playing, having fun, frolicking around. Mm. And eventually it's going to get sort of dark and then they think about making their lovely beds. They sleep for as long as it's dark and that's what they do every night. And then they wake up when the sun rises and they start again. It's just very yeah, beautiful. And as I said, quite simple. But, but that's how we would have lived. Though. It's how we would have lived. Yeah, yeah. In many ways, we'd be a lot healthier probably if we did live like that. But I'm yeah. reminded of, have you ever read the book, 4,000 Weeks? And it opens with that, talking about until the Industrial Revolution, mm. we had no concept of time. Mm. Yeah. Time was literally yeah. when the sun went down, you went yeah. to bed, when you yeah. came up, you yeah, did totally. it. And yeah. It sounds very similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's interesting you bring that up because I also thought the same thing when I read the book. And it's like the concept of time that we've created is almost like, it's almost created a prison for us to exist in. Like, yeah. now it feels like there's never enough of it because now we feel like it's a, a scarce resource. Yes. I love that bit of the parenting moment mm. in with the chimpanzees in the forest episode mm. where the kids have kind of gone off and they found some, some bees nesting in sort of a low broken branch. And with bees, you get honey. So you see the kids, if you like, they've got sticks and they're poking it into this beehive. Kids will be kids, right? Kids will be kids, you know, exactly. Chimp kids will be chimp kids. And, you know, they're getting kind of stung and bothered, but they really want this honey, don't they? You know, and the, the dad's sort of sat there almost with his arms crossed like, oh, for God's sake, you know, you're so <laughs> ridiculous and so pathetic. You've got a lot to learn. So rather than sort of get involved, he just allows them to like get stung. And, and then he wanders off. You think, what's he doing? And he goes over and he breaks a branch. He gets this big old stick and he's like, then he goes over to this little patch of ground. He's sort of sniffing about, poking it in the ground like this. And you're like, what, what is he doing? What is he doing? And eventually he finds a spot and he gets it in there and he pulls it up and he sniffs the end of it. He's like, yeah, that'd do. Puts his hand in, he pulls out a load of honey, doesn't he? And he just sits there eating this honey and suddenly the kids are like, oh, that's what we want. So then the kids come around and they're looking at dad, aren't they? He's eating the honey and he just carries on eating it. And the kids are looking at him like, please, dad, can we just have a little bit, please, dad? And he just eats it, puts his hand back down, gets another big lump. Oh, this is white, you know, puts that in. Yummy, yummy. Puts his hand in. Yeah. And the kids are like, please, you know, getting closer to him. Literally almost like drooling, you know, give me some honey, give me some honey. And he just finishes what he wants and he wanders off and they're all like, oh, great, here we go. Put their hand in. Oh, there's none left. <laughs> you know? But he's wandered <laughs> off and he's given them a bit of a lesson there, isn't he? You know, and he's like, oh, you're, you know. But anyway, it's just so delightful and charming and just, yeah, yeah. powerful, I think. Yeah. yeah. Delightful. Really powerful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, let's talk then about your own journeys into this. Mm. Because, you know, you, you've you got huge experience in this field. Mm -hmm. 25? 28 now. 28 yeah. years. Um, and Harry? I'm more fresh. Just coming up to eight years now. Right. Yeah. Well, let's talk then about. Um, I think the first place to start is why did you choose to live a life like this? <laughs> <laughs> I ask myself this every day. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. Um, I. Why did I choose to do this? Uh, well, 
So I, I grew up in Birmingham in the city and actually didn't have much contact with the natural world, pets, anything like that, but just have always had this real obsession with animals, always loved them, always wanted to work close to them, be close to them. Um, and my passion for that really grew through watching wildlife documentaries, through watching like, you know, Big Day of Attenborough documentaries, that kind of thing. I burned out my copy of Blue Planet when I was a kid from watching it so many times. Um, so that was really my way to connect with the natural world and that really sparked a lifelong passion for me. I went on to study at uni and, and then I thought I was going to go into conservation but ended up becoming an intern at the BBC and then here we are. Um, so yeah, I, I just really, because it really helped me kind of get in touch with my passion, I'm, I feel really strongly about communicating that to other people and like giving people access to see those places and experience wildlife that they might not ever have the opportunity to do otherwise. And, you know, it's very nice to get to go and see that stuff myself. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah. I think everyone's got their story. But for me, um, I grew up in a small town in the Cotswolds called Sirencester. Um, as a kid, probably like a lot of kids, I loved TV, but never thought for one moment. You know, my dad was a car mechanic and my mum was a dinner lady. So mm. working in television was not something that, you know, even entered my head. But I always then had a passion for the countryside, for nature. Um, always used to love um, just... Yeah, seeing animals, whatever, pets as well. Um, eventually that grew, I did sciences at school, did sciences at A-level, and then went to university and did an environmental science degree, which was quite broad, sort of biology. Um, and then I had friends at another university who were doing media arts, so they were making television. And I used to go down and help them make their films, do a bit of boom mopping and stuff. And then it suddenly dawned on me, can I marry this sort of passion and love for the natural world with television? And it was like, oh yeah, perhaps I can do that. So I wrote then begging letters to the BBC Natural History Unit asking for an opportunity, work experience basically. And um, I graduated in the summer of 96 and they offered me a placement literally a week after. And I took that and uh, I was working for nothing and then got offered a runner's contract and it's built from there really. So I've been at the BBC Natural History Unit now for 28 years. Have you ever had a moment where given your obvious passion for for the environment and nature that you've, that you've had where it's taken your breath away that you're actually present to witness it? Yeah, I mean, it happens to be every single time I go on location. <laughs> like, I physically, genuinely pinch myself all the time on trips for work. Um, and it's an incredible privilege to be in the position where I have to do that because some of the stuff that we've seen and that I've seen like has blown my mind. Like, I will never forget turning up in Ngorongoro Crater to film the hyenas for the mm. Dark Episode of Mammals. And it was my first experience in like an African safari type environment. And driving around there, it felt like being in The Lion King. You know, like yeah, yeah. there was like giraffes and there was hippos and there was like birds flying through the sky and there was a lion and there was a hyena. And it like, I was like, what am I? Like, what is going on? Um, but that was really incredible. And then I had, well, at the time was quite a terrifying, but actually very, very magical moment with an elephant on mammals when we were filming, we were filming at night in Victoria Falls, which is a town in Zimbabwe, right on the edge of a, quite a few national parks. So elephants come into the town at night sneakily in order to access food, right? People like water their lawns and grow food there. It's an amazing abundance for elephants and they've worked out, you know, use their intelligence to work out a way to come into the town and access this resource. But when you're filming an animal as big as an elephant in a space like a residential street, there suddenly isn't a lot of room for you. Imagine driving a four by four in like an alleyway, but the traffic trying to overtake you is a herd of elephants. And suddenly you're like, wow, we're really close for comfort. Um, and one particular night, the matriarch of this family we've been following, she got really interested in our car and she came right up to us, right up to me. It's an open sided vehicle. There's no doors, windows or anything. So it's just, I'm sitting right there and she comes up as close as you are right now. Her whole head filled the side of the car like I couldn't see anything else. She was enormous. And she just like reached in and then tugged on my jacket. And like my heart was obviously in my mouth. I don't think I was breathing. <laughs> I was shaking. Um, and she like mm. came up, smelt my face, breathed in my face. The smell of an elephant's breath is something I never thought I would ever experience, <laughs> but amazing. And I just like couldn't believe it. She like walked away. I was like, 
oh my god, <laughs> you had a moment. moment. I was like physically shaking. It was absolutely mental, um, but also just an amazing connection. Like she looked right at me. Really, she was you know a wild animal. Something that I've dreamt of seeing my whole life, and it was just like extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Wow, what a lovely fun. story. <laughs> I'm not sure I can follow that really. <laughs> no, I mean, we've been very fortunate, been to some incredible places. For me, one of the most powerful experiences was when I went to the Arctic to film polar bears. We had a bit of a tough time. The weather was bad, and one of the s snowmobiles went through the sea ice that we were traveling on because actually it was getting too warm. We had to camp out. We had a whiteout, 36 hours in a two man tent with two guys about as big as you and I was the meat in the sandwich, you know. Anyway, the sun came up and, you know, eventually got on our way and then we, we found this male polar bear, which was extraordinary in itself. And we're sat there filming it um, with the snowmobiles pretty close by. But this polar bear's, you know, it's up on its legs, it's checking us out. And suddenly it starts coming towards us. And suddenly it was that moment where it's like, oh my God, it's looking at us like we're prey. So suddenly we're being stalked by a polar bear and just seeing that animal doing what it's doing, sniffing, gradually coming towards you and it's got these eyes and basically all you can see are those eyes, they're black and um, it's like, you're a meal, you know, that's all it's thinking, you're a meal and I'm gonna, you know, so that, that, that was incredibly powerful and the only way we didn't kind of get munched was we had to start the snowmobile which kind of freaked it out a bit and then, you know. Mm. But the last thing we want to do is disturb anyone, <laughs> but in that moment we didn't really have a lot of choice. Yeah. Yeah. But um, again, it's just incredibly humbling. And being in the Arctic, one of those places, the silence. Because this is, I think this is where it gets really interesting, right? You are visitors in someone else's world yeah. at this mm. point, right? You're no longer the top of the tree exactly. because you're not in our, in our world. Yet you have to still find your own versions of high performance. You still have to create and produce content that is going to capture the imagination of millions of people and by the way congratulations because the track record with your department is that you've proven you do it and you know you've ignited the imagination of millions of people over the years with it mm. so i'm really interested in how you how you as a group find high performance in those environments like what are the what are the challenges and what are the moments when you have to rise to the challenge to deliver i mean planning is always key isn't it I mean, yeah, preparation is absolutely essential. <laughs> For real. Yeah, you can't just roll the dice and hope it's all just going to land. You've got to, I mean, nature, nature's in charge. Nature's writing the scripts. You're kind of in the hands of, of, of the animals, of the wildlife, and you've got to be prepared for that. And you kind of got to, in your mind, have what could, how could this play out? What are the scenarios that could potentially happen? And as I said, be as best as you can prepared for that. And that's about having then the right kit. Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of the dark, yeah, yeah. You want to make sure you're using the right equipment. You want to have spoke. We, we rely a lot on experts, scientific experts, conservationists, local knowledge. You want to speak to the right people and get as close an approximation as you possibly can to when is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? How, what time is it going to happen? How do you even work out when you're going to see a group of baboons? Like, how do you, I mean, I'm thinking, how do you even find them? That, that story like, came... Yeah. yeah, I mean, sorry. That story came about because, again, we have, a, we have quite a network of people and people... You know, we do fishing ourselves, if you like, trying to find stories. Mm. And um, that came about through a team who are based in Zim uh, Zambia. In Zambia. In Zambia. And they'd anecdotally spotted some sort of behaviour with this leopard. And sort of, like, oh, it seems to be, you know, quite regularly we're seeing it, you know, with a, eating a baboon, for example, yeah, sort yeah. of in the yeah. early morning light. Something's going on, it's catching baboons. And it seems to be doing that at night. That got fed back to us. And then we were like, okay, well, we then invested a bit of time in those guys, well, could you stay out with this leopard at night and see what's yeah. going on? And then they got anecdotal reports coming back, oh, it seems to be going up in the trees, you know, we haven't actually seen it hunting a baboon, but that's what we think is happening. So then we're like, that's enough for us to like build on that and um, yeah. deploy and then, all the right kit to then try and capture the behavior. And then yeah. a month in the field, we got that moment. Today's episode is in partnership with Manual, and I'm so pleased to be joined by Dr. Irim. Let's talk about hair loss then. 50% of men who have hair loss find that their hair loss is affecting their self-esteem, their career, and their body image as well. What do you do for them? Manual offers a range of treatments that support their hair growth when they start getting male pattern balding. If you would like treatment for your hair loss, then all you need to do is click the link in the description to this show and use the code HP55 for 55% off your first treatment. Um, yeah. It was a month. It was a month in the story. field. Yeah. yeah. See, because that's a bit we don't say. Like, <laughs> like this is one and of the things that we often say. Like a lot of our guests say that almost like people get distracted by the outcome and not the process. Yeah. And it's the yeah. process that 
tells you and it's who's going to be at the output. You have to be so disciplined and it is almost like military operation, like Stuart, the director on that sequence, mm. who's going every night and all he had, it's pitch black. You can't see a thing. And yeah. he had like a sort of, you know, um, military grade yeah, scope. Yeah, yeah, like a scope. And he's just spending his whole evening looking through this scope trying to spot. Which makes you, know. you totally night blind and like yeah. insane. He's... As someone who's used it, you're like... <laughs> Take us through the emotions you experience when moments like that happen and you're the only witness to it on the planet. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's pretty like mind blowing when you see something like that. And it's obviously what you're hoping to see. You've spent months and months, if not years, planning for that moment and hoping and praying it's going to happen and getting yourself in the right position with the right people in order to capture it if it does. But stuff like that might only happen once. You know, in if you go for a month, a moment like that could only happen one time. And if you miss it, then you've really messed it up. So and that is high performance then is required because yeah, it's almost like being a, I don't know if it's a good analogy or an appropriate one, but like being a sniper, you might only get that one shot to drop <laughs> that guy. Yeah, You can't afford to miss it. And yeah. for us, we can't afford to miss that moment because it might not happen again. It but, might happen again, no. And no. then... And then, then, yeah, then you've wasted all this time, energy, like everyone else's time, energy, and everything in. Has it happened? Not getting it. Oh, it's happened. It happens all the time. It's a, high, it's a highly stressful situation. <laughs> yeah. And um, everyone is, you know, probably not blinking for a decent period of time. Yeah, you sort of stop breathing. You go into this weird, like, hyper focus. Like, when something like that's happening, you see the leopard start, like, creeping up the tree, and you can, like, see the baboons waiting or whatever. You're all like, you're like, are you on it? Have you done this? Is your settings right? Have you checked this? Do this. Remember and then you talk, like, so that sometimes starts to happen. We're, and are we're you like whispering, whispering constantly? You might be whispering. You might be whispering so quietly, but really, you don't want to disturb what's happening. So at that point, you're kind of like... You're locked in, aren't you? You're locked in. And everyone knows their role. Everyone knows yeah. how to play this. I mean, again, just any movement in the vehicle. If you suddenly start scratching around, then that's mm. the cameraman. It's going to shake the whole camera. You so where was that film it. from? That, that was, was filmed from within a car. That's from within a vehicle. Using a thermal camera, which has like a quite a long lens on it. And because the leopard was in the tree, they've got the camera almost at this kind of angle. It's really precarious, difficult position to be in. And it's pitch black. They couldn't have any lights on in the car because if the leopard had seen it or the baboons had seen those lights, you've blown the whole thing, no one's going to do anything. So they're in the pitch black, trying not to breathe, trying not to move, trying not to jostle stuff. And somehow the camera operator is still capturing this beautiful footage for us to use. Um, yeah, and then you just got to watch it play out and hope it goes well and hope nothing goes wrong. And then it's about getting that moment. Then it's about getting cutaways. Just again, like a drama. You, you know, you need to be able yeah. to then build a sequence and tell a story. Well, that was a bit that, like, when I watched that, I, I, I said this to you before, that two minutes before I watched that, mm. I'd never given more than a second start to mm. a baboon. Mm. And within three minutes of watching it, you yeah. had me gripped. I cared yeah, deeply. Yeah, I was yeah, upset. Yeah. I felt yeah. like bereft yeah. when that baboon yeah. falls out of the tree and it starts to get eaten. Yeah. And and I think there's something really valuable you can teach us and our listeners, which is how do you get people to care about something mm. that you that they don't necessarily know they should care about? Mm. I, th I think that's yeah. storytelling. And again, we want the we want to engage the audience. We want them to be to be gripped as you were. So. That's about pacing, that's about the delivery of David's voice, that's about how we use music and create dramatic tension just as you would in a drama. What, what we're not doing is just giving you the ABC of a leopard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a leopard, it has spots, it does this, da, 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 da. We're bringing you into their world and really immersing you in it. So we push our sells very hard yeah. with our storytelling. So not only are we putting off all our field skills and craft, you know, to capture this behavior. We're then really analyzing how we then present it within the shows. And I think that's an art form in itself. And one that I think in the last 20 years has really been turned up a notch in our genre. Yeah, And absolutely. I think that's why our shows sit at prime time and do well. Yeah. yeah. Something else I think is really interesting is that almost everything else that you film, if you miss a shot, you can go back and recreate it. Mm. Mm. You don't have that luxury. Oh, so, so we don't know. What are the processes you go through to make sure that by the time you get back to an edit suite in Bristol from the plains of Africa, <laughs> there's no missed shots, there's no missed opportunities? Yeah, I mean, we... It's a, it's a skill set that you develop over time, like anything. 
I think. And so there are going to be times, especially near the beginning of your career, where you are going to miss stuff. Yeah. And I think or my big learning experience for me is like when you take your own footage into the edit, yeah. you start really seeing the holes and you think to yourself, oh, I should have got should have got that shot. Or it'd be so helpful if I had a shot now of a close-up of that animal's face or like something that would just really help sell it. And then, so then the next time you go out, you're going to be better. And the next time after that, you're going to be better. And it's that kind of process. Um, you have a shot list, don't you? I mean, we would go out all we the shot go list. Out, yeah. Sometimes we even have storyboards, which is like our dream scenario, if you like, of what, okay. how we want this to play out. So but again, you have to be prepared for nature to rewrite that script. So if, if you had to prioritise, what, like, how would you describe the priority of your role? Is it to educate or is it to entertain? Is it to get people to be activists or is it just to be pacifists and watch it? It's that marriage of both. We want yeah. people to engage with the natural world and realise it's out there. And for me, particularly with mammals, you know, we're mammals ourselves, aren't we? And yeah. as we said, we're the most sophisticated of all the mammals. But with that sophistication and with our rise to the top and our ever-growing population, I think comes a responsibility towards all the other mammals we share the planet with. Totally agree. But and more and more we're in direct contact with these other animals. And so that responsibility is getting heavier and heavier. Yeah, and I, I love it when you travel to countries and you see an incredible tolerance towards wild animals that sometimes you don't necessarily see in our own country. Like where, for example? So there's, there's an example in India where there's tigers living very close to a town and local people tolerate those tigers. And in actual fact, the tigers are benefiting from the people because there's cattle there, cattle that are no longer needed, but they're allowed to just wander around. And the tigers are able to take the cattle and they don't interfere with people. Sure, if they suddenly became man-eaters, there would be a problem, but there's this kind of coexistence going on. It's just this beautiful thing. Yeah. And I don't think that anyone's necessarily planned that, but it's just kind of played out like that. So in the daytime, you'll see people walking down a path, and then at nighttime, those people won't be there, but there'll be a tiger walking down that path. I mean, can you imagine that in this country? I don't know. Am I being unreasonable? Am I being unfair? It would make the front page of the Daily Mail anyway. <laughs> it's quite it? wild, yeah. There's another, like, example that we featured in Mammals in the New Wild episode, second episode, um, which is in Singapore, they had this big environmental movement to really make the city really green, and they cleared up the waterways through the process of doing this, and that brought um, the Asian short called otter back into the cities, and now there are these huge groups of otters mm. roaming around the city centre, and not only did people like let them be there and, and wherever they're like, happily integrated into the city, but they're super excited. They have a whole fan base, these otters. Yeah. There's Facebook pages dedicated to them, people who are so excited to see them every time and the otters are completely fearless because of it. They run around happy as Larry in this city, huge metropolitan city, crossing the road, swimming in and out of beautiful clear waterways all through the city. And people are just so, so elated whenever they see them. Love that. And I think that's also, nature can give you that back. Yeah. You know, when you see a wild animal, it gives you a good feeling, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's proven it's good for your mental health, you know, being in natural yeah. spaces and engaging with wildlife. Yeah, but the problem is, as, as we get closer to them, we cause them more problems. Quite often. And I think it's very important that we touch on this as well, because I think one of the, the key jobs that you do is mm. open our eyes to the impact of humankind on the animal population. Would you mind sharing with us the sort of most heartbreaking thing that you've seen out there that we have created and continue to create? I mean, f for me, it was a sequence that I filmed for this series, um, which was quite harrowing even to film. Um, we, we went to film cheetahs hunting, which is something that every child dreams of seeing, right? They're all in the picture books, whatever. Um, and I'd never seen a cheetah in my life. So just to get the opportunity to see a cheetah in the flesh was amazing. But the story that we wanted to tell, and it was very much just like a purely observational story, was about people, and especially tourists, having a real passion for cheetahs. Everyone wants to go to Africa and see a cheetah, it's the dream. But the way in which some of those vehicles and stuff engage with the wildlife can have a real indirect pressure on those species. So cheetahs, there's been some studies on them recently, and though, you know, tourists are around them and they're potentially still making kills and stuff, it's the indirect pressure on them is really having a massive impact on the, the survival rates of their cubs. So, you know, I think the latest studies are saying that in areas where there's high tourism, cheetah cubs have 
um, you know, a, a 10 times less likely to, to make it. Why? Just because of the indirect pressure on adults in order to hunt and survive in those environments when while they're surrounded by cars and people. Like it's quite, I think it's quite an overwhelming experience for those animals. It gives them so much more to think about than just hunting and surviving. They're also thinking about dodging vehicles and, and how they negotiate that landscape, but also um, they can't hear as well. There's noise, it's very noisy, like being in the situation where we, we were in a place where we could see this happening, you know, these vehicles are noisy, people are talking, people are yelling, people are using their cameras with the clicky sound on, like it's, it feels a bit like being in the paparazzi, like yep. it, you can imagine that that kind of environment would, would be hard to perform your best in, sure. right? And, and I think that for me was a really difficult thing to watch as someone, as not only as a filmmaker, but as someone who loves wildlife. It's really difficult because without the reserves and the national parks in the yeah, world, th there would be no place for exactly. wildlife, there'd be no space. But it's yeah. about that balance and it's about just totally. making sure we're showing respect and remembering these are wild animals just trying to go about their lives. Yep. And we're piling in there. You know, it's not, um, it's not a theme park. You know, yeah, this, it's not the safari park. This know, is their this territory. Is, this is real life for these animals. And if you're piling in and you're pushing drivers to get closer so you can get a selfie with a cheetah. And I think some of that selfiness, mm. no, that's not a word, is it? <laughs> I know what you mean. You know what I mean, don't you? That yeah, desire yeah. to get a selfie, and that, that means you've got to get that much closer. Where yeah. maybe 10 years ago, when people were more going out with their telescopic lenses, they were, they were hanging back a bit more. And I think things have changed quite recently because of the the phone, yeah. if you like. It's and, difficult. Um, it's an interesting one. And mm. I, don't, I don't think people are doing this deliberately. No, no one's trying not. to disturb the cheetah hunt. Mm. It's just, it's, I think it's a bit more education, a bit more knowledge and understanding. Yeah, and totally. we're, we're hoping this the sequence can do that. But at the same time, we just present what is going on. Yeah. We're, we're not finger wagging at anyone. It's brilliantly shot, by the way, that sequence. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where the camera angle, it kind of like, the cars are surprising every time it comes into shot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. brilliantly it's voyeuristic, doesn't it? Brilliantly that's, that's what we wanted yeah. it to feel. Because yours feels intimate, yeah. and that just feels like you've been a voyeur seeing, yeah. seeing exactly. it through the eyes can, there. Can I just, um, before we move to our quick fire questions, that's ask okay. you about um, a really high performance mammal, Sir David Attenborough? <laughs> uh, I, I assume you've both spent time working with him, and I would love to know really what you learned from him. That, that you take into your daily work. I mean, I was lucky enough to be with him yesterday. He's 97, he's 98 this year. He's such an incredible human being. And just, I mean, just a humble guy, you know, still incredibly grounded, still coming at what he's doing for the right reasons. It's not about him. He always defers all the glory to everyone else in the nicest possible way. But he's just a, just a very genuine human being who cares deeply about the natural world and he wants to present it and he wants people to fall in love with it like he loves it. And his passion for it is not diminished in the slightest and his energy and he's just infectious. We were lucky yesterday, he, it was a press screening and he said a few words and what he said was just absolutely so delight, delightful. I'm not going to try and repeat it. I'm not David Attenborough. But um, he just has an ability to, to communicate in a way that is just extraordinary. And if it wasn't for David Amber, I think the world would be a, a much sadder place. And it, in terms of people, you know, understanding of natural history would be a lot smaller. So I think he's done an incredible job and he's done an incredible career. But as a human being, he's the most incredible guy. And I think we could all learn a lot from him. And I, What have you learned from him? What have I learned from him? Just to stay grounded and to remember why you're doing this and to be a good person. I mean, he, he could be the most demanding clicky finger guy you could ever meet, you know, it's Sir David Attenborough, but he's not. You know, and I think... Yeah, he's incredibly humble. Yeah, I think humble's the word. Yeah. But um, he's just always so delightful when you see him. It's like he's sort yeah. of tipping his head to you. It's like, David, crikey. You oh. know, What's, what he's, have you learned from him? What's he said to you that's lived with you, Harry? <laughs> I mean, yeah, David was an incredibly humble man. Um, as someone who basically defined a genre, like he, you know, has had an amazing career. Um, and... The first time I met him, I swear to God, time stood still as we shook hands. I was like, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I would hate for him to watch this and hear this, but it was like, it felt like meeting Santa. Like it felt like meeting a fictional, yeah. like magical person. But he was so nice 
and so grounded when we talked. Um, and his something he said to me, which I have tried to remember all the time, was like, just don't forget to enjoy it. Like, he was like, don't forget to enjoy. That's the other thing the about Dave. He's got a great sense of humour. He's, he's a funny very guy. Very funny. Yeah, he's cheeky. He's funny. You know? Yeah. But he's like the dream granddad. If you could. Have a, I wish. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. imagine him reading you a bedtime story. You know? yeah. yeah. Just be amazing. So quick fire questions. Yes. The three non-negotiable behaviours that you need to do the job that you both do. The job that I do, so both in the office and directing, is probably um, communication skills. It's really a team effort. Um, and you've got to be open to learning from other people and communicating with your team at all times. Passion, you have to have passion for something, be that wildlife, be that filmmaking, be that technology. That passion is what's going to make your shows really, really stand out. And a third thing. I think res resilience. Resilience you've is a good one. You've got to be resilient, you know, for lots of reasons. When you're sat in the, the vehicle for the 20th day and you've not filmed a anything it's just sort of hanging in there and just having the strength to do that and keeping going very nice yeah totally what advice would you give to yourself as teenagers growing up in Sirencester and Birmingham blimey <laughs> what advice would I give myself um don't try and force yourself in someone else's box like you what you bring to the game is amazing in its own right and that's what's going to really propel you to where you you need to be. Yeah, don't be afraid to dream. Don't be afraid to dream and don't be afraid to, you know, follow your heart and, and when you get an opportunity, take it, you know, and give it your all, you know. In your long and longish careers, what is the, what's the single most remarkable thing that you've seen in, in the natural world? Oh, Jake, that's, that's, that's a tricky one. I've already talked about the polar bear, but um, I have to say, going to the Arctic and being in that, the most wildest of places in my opinion just just that whole arena it, it just blew my mind i think for me actually yes i've had some really amazing close encounters with wildlife and that's really taken my breath away and put me out of my body at times but to be honest there's been some landscapes that i've been to similar to what we we're saying about oh. the arctic um where it's just so pristine and unimaginably brilliant mm. that it feels like your brain can't really comprehend that what you're looking at is real. It feels like looking at like a window screensaver. Being somewhere where humanity's not touched it. Yeah. That is, yeah. do you know what I mean? There are still places on the planet that are like that. And if you get the opportunity to go to them. It's absolutely indescribable. It's so strange to be somewhere where you can't see a sign of humanity anywhere. And it's all just total wilderness. And the final question, your one golden reason for people to watch mammals? This is a good question. I mean, I think so people will fall in love with their fellow mammals and um, realise how incredible they are and how amazing they are. And um, ultimately, if they end up caring about them just a little bit more, I think that'd be incredible. Yeah, absolutely agree with Roger. It's all about connecting with mammals on some level and experiencing what an amazing group of animals they are and we are. Yeah. And understanding a sense of responsibility that we have to coexist with, with these species. Brilliant. Thank you both very much indeed. Love that.